studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Good evening. I'm Ethan Bronner. I'm a managing editor at Bloomberg News. I'm filling in for Charlie Rose, who is on assignment. Joining me now is Jeffrey Robertson, a distinguished British barrister. He's argued many landmark cases in human rights as well as criminal and media law. He's currently part of the legal team representing Armenia at the European Court of Human Rights. The case will determine whether denying the genocide of Armenians under Ottoman rule is a criminal offense in Switzerland. This year marks the centennial of the mass killings during World War I. Robertson is also the author of the book, An Inconvenient Genocide, Who Now Remembers the Armenians? I'm pleased to have him here. Welcome. Hi, Ethan. So, uh, you know, I, the, the, the topic, I want to divide it into at least two, mm. two parts. One is what happened, and the other is how we talk about it and sure. why it matters. So why don't we start with what happened nearly 100 years ago next sure. year? Sure. In 1915, in uh, April the 24th, the Istanbul authorities, Constant Constantinople it was called then, rounded up the Armenian intellectuals, the community leaders, took them off and killed them, and that was the beginning of a genocide which took over half the Armenian race. The Turks now say, we only killed about 800,000, but uh, probably over one million were killed, more than half. The Armenian people were rounded up. They were, the men were generally shot if they were over 12. The women, children and old men were put on 400, 500 mile marches across the desert to places that we only know now because they're occupied by ISIS. Yes, sir. Beyond Olympia. And they died. They mm -hmm. died uh, of typhus. They died of dysentery. They were attacked. Uh, they were raped. The women were taken off very often as converts. And their property was expropriated. They were forced to march, the laws are there, and then the abandoned property laws because they weren't coming back. So, so over so this half was, died. Yeah, this was so genocide as we now know it. Okay, so it was a term that didn't exist until the 1930s? It didn't. Uh, it was invented by a brilliant Polish Jewish lawyer called Rafael Lemkin. And he was obsessed by the what happened to the Armenians, the massacres, the ethnic Which is cleansing. interesting, because he was a, a Polish Jew in the 1930s. Sure. And he, did he sense something was well, happening? Well, he started in 1922. There was something called Operation Nemesis that got the main perpetrator, the guy who was the Hitler of the Ottoman Hitler, mm -hmm. was shot, assassinated in Berlin and put on trial the assassin was acquitted after the jury heard of the horror that he'd gone through with his family being killed, watching his mother being uh, raped and so forth. And the evidence came from Lutheran missionaries, it came from German generals who'd been there and horrified at what the Ottoman Turks were doing. And Lemkin thought, this is wrong. This is justice, as the Armenians saw it, nemesis, but this is no way for the world to go. We need a law that can overleap the national sovereignty boundaries and say, no matter how much you are ordered by your government to kill a particular race or a particular religion, there is an international law that will eventually put because you on trial. Then, if, you're, if a nation killed its own, there was no legal framework to try it. Not until Nuremberg. Right. Nuremberg was the beginning of international mm -hmm. criminal law. Uh, I mean, the British, uh, when they won in 1918, took uh, 68 of the main perpetrators to Malta to put them on trial right. and realized they couldn't try them That's because there was this Westphalian sovereignty idea that no prince or head of state can be held liable for killing his own people. So we have this irony, which is this man invents this term to apply to this event. Exactly. And now the whole debate is whether this term applies to this event. <laughs> That's right. And, and we had a genocide convention in 1948 
and Raphael Lemkin, the author of it, was inspired, as I say, by the Armenian genocide. Uh, right. But now Turkey uh, is neuralgic about the genocide and makes all sorts of threats. There's this question of freedom of speech and expression yep. in Europe versus the United States, the sure. fact that in these countries like in Switzerland it is illegal to deny genocide mm. of, of Armenians or uh, the Holocaust. Mm. So let's start with the Turks' view. Right. Why are they so horrified by this term? The G word sends shivers down state spines because it's against international law. There's the possibility of compensation if you commit genocide. Ronald Reagan ratified the Genocide Convention. Let's remember, America doesn't ratify many international laws, but on this one, uh, America was a bit nervous in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Remember how America and Britain lied in the Security Council uh, to pretend mm -hmm. that it wasn't genocide. genocide when it was because they feared they'd have to do something about it. So Turkey has come up with this idea that it was military necessity to deport or at all least the they Armenians. have asserted, and others have, that it was in the middle of a war, and yeah. it was complicated. Yeah. People died, but it wasn't the same thing as putting people in ovens in World War II. It was military necessity right. to get rid of a possible fifth column. But, you know, deporting women and children and old men uh, across a desert as they die isn't necessary for any military. If you've got uh, anyone who's a possible traitor, you can intern them, you can detain them, you can prosecute them, but that's not what they but were But do you think, Jeffrey, that um, standards have changed? In other words, that because we live in a post-Holocaust world today, we have much greater sensitivity toward what happened, not that under any circumstances, by anyone's description, mm. what happened was okay, but the question is whether it was so unusual um, compared with today. I think Lemkin's genius was to identify racial and religious passions as particularly mm -hmm. igniting. And the Armenian genocide is important to study. There was a Turkification campaign. There are all sorts of nationalism. Yes. There were the changing of Christian names to Muslim names and so forth. And this is a pattern that we can see recurring in Bangladesh and Guatemala with the Mayans, with the, the Rwanda and the Tutsis. I could go on in, sure. in uh, uh, Indonesia in the 60s, the killing of the Chinese and so on. Uh, this in is, the Armenian case, the fact that they were Christian, do you think that was a very important part? Oh, of a lot happened? of them were killed to the Allah Akbar, and the young Turkish government had a tame imam whom they got to pronounce a fatwa on Christians and suddenly realized they had to exclude Germans because Germans were their allies. Okay, so this happened. Now, what does it mean for the Turks to acknowledge? In other words, when we say that uh, compensation could occur, mm. who makes that decision? Well, it's uh, possibly a legal decision, and it could, in Europe, the European Court of Human Rights has already ordered Turkey to compensate uh, those Greek Cypriots that it threw out of northern Cyprus. That was 50 years right. ago. There are still living memories. I mean, uh, President Obama, a couple of years ago, had tea with... Uh, a genocide survivor yes. who was 103 and the world's most famous Armenian, who's of course Kim Kardashian. But uh, that is, it's still for children, for grandchildren. These people uh, live it. And, you know, I'm an Australian actually, and we were the reason we were on the Anzac beaches on Gallipoli, and my great uncle was shot by a Turkish sniper. I don't remember him much because he volunteered to fight the Turkish sniper who was lawfully defending his own position. But it's different with victims of an international crime. That's, sure. that's why I think uh, uh, this is not a tragedy, as genocide deniers call it. It was a crime, the crime of genocide, as we now call it. Then it was called a crime against humanity. And because they're victims of crime and it's been unrequited, uh, I think today uh, there are 2,000 churches 
in Turkey that uh, have been expropriated by the Ottomans, uh, they should be restored. So on the one hand, we have the Turks, of course, they're, they, they're the ones being accused of having done mm. this, so they say, no, that's not what happened, mm. and that's an issue you need to deal with. But there are, there's a geopolitical issue, too, which is mm. that the United States government, the British government, have not, in fact, been willing to, to insist that this is what happened well, this because is of their relationship with Turkey? Because Why? Turkey is more important. I mean... President Obama, when he went campaigning in 2008, said, I'm a lawyer, I know it was genocide, and I'm going to say it was when I'm president. He doesn't ever use the G word, he uses Med Jürgen, which no one right. understands, it's Armenian for the great catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Britain, uh, which was most active in denouncing these atrocities in 1915, suddenly when Turkey became important, started saying, Oh, the evidence is not sufficiently unequivocal, which was a beautiful British right. Mandarin <laughs> crafted uh, deceitful phrase. And I did a Freedom of Information Act search, and I found the memorandum explaining to ministers why this formula had to be used. And it actually said, Turkey is neuralgic, good word, on this subject. Um, our position is unethical, but the strategic and commercial uh, realities mean there is no other option. Turkey just goes crazy, and we need Turkey. NATO needs Turkey at a time its air bases, its spy bases but can you, are being I mean, I used. I guess the question is, can you mm. imagine a need great enough to say that, well, maybe this is not so important to use the G word? Well... I think that President Erdogan is faced with a problem, a lot of problems with his dispute with Armenia. Now, he doesn't understand genocide. He says uh, it couldn't have been genocide because there are still Armenians living in Turkey. I see. People uh -huh. just don't understand right. that genocide means wiping out part of a race, as they did in Srebrenica. That was genocide. They don't, you don't have to find an order. There was no order mm -hmm. to kill the Jews. Mm -hmm. What is fascinating is to look at the language that was used by the Turks and the language that was used by Adolf Eichmann in his Vanze memorandum. They weren't uh, deporting, they were relocating right. or evacuating right. the Jews, right. but that was based on the language that the Ottomans used of the Armenians. They didn't, uh, their laws of abandoned property. Uh, property wasn't abandoned, they were of forced course. out. No, I and so the these same are all these euphemisms, euphemisms, the genocide euphemisms, so, so are very much the same. For the, the next mm. minute or two, that you're right, that this unquestionably was genocide. Mm. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of reason to think that. The next question is why should it be against the law? To deny it. Uh, we are not used to that in the United States. No, of course you're not, but you've never been occupied by the Nazis. You've never had part of your population extinguished. In Europe, it's a different matter. The French, the Belgians were occupied, the Germans and the Austrians <laughs> did the occupying, and I mean, uh, that is why we have this peculiar European idea that it can be wrong to, and, and against the law, for people to deny the existence of gas chambers and so forth. And if you deny one genocide, and that's against the law, why not? If you, if you deny another genocide, should that not be against the law? So it was uh, a difficult case for uh, when this crazy nationalist Turk who, mm -hmm. who loves challenging genocide denial laws. He goes throughout Europe saying the Armenian genocide is a lie and hopes to be convicted. And uh, for Amal Clooney and I, who are brought up more in the American tradition, uh, which, which is, is still alive in Britain, that uh, where you draw the line is against the guy who shouts fire in a crowded theatre. So um, we uh, argued uh, as a basis for a sort of European-wide law that uh, you should only prosecute genocide deniers 
where they do real harm, where there is, their intention is to vilify a minority community. So that was the distinction the court and had And that's to what make. you're accusing. That's why you're taking this case well, against we, uh, we are not taking the case. We are, we, our position on behalf of the Armenian government was to simply set a standard, to say this is the standard and you apply it to the facts of this case one way or the other. But the reason we had intervened was that the first court decision was incredibly silly. It said, well, th there may not have been an Armenian genocide because there were no gas chambers. It wasn't as well proven as the Holocaust. But of course, it, it, there are photographs, there are, there are laws. There's the deportation law, the abandoned property law. It is just as well. More about the Turks also, because mm. under Erdogan, there has been a kind of liberalizing attitude toward Attitude, attitudes toward minorities, the Kurds and yeah. the Armenians. Yeah. He did sort of say a terrible thing happened, but he hasn't apologized for it and he hasn't called it genocide. Is that right? That's and is right. it still. Well, he hasn't said, and this confounds every genocide denier, you say to them, all right, well, if it wasn't genocide, it was a crime against humanity. Yeah. Uh, and they've got no answer because uh -huh. undoubtedly it was, and genocide is one genus of a crime against humanity. But Turkey has not used that phrase. Ube, I, so I think what will, and, and Turkey's entry to the European Union may depend on this, uh, if Erdogan can bring himself at least to acknowledge that it was a crime against humanity, to give back some of the churches and allow them to be used as Christian mm -hmm. churches, and maybe make some symbolic gesture. I've suggested Mount Ararat, which of course is uh, the great mystical mountain, Noah's Ark and so forth, and it would be, it overshadows Yerevan, which is the Armenian yeah, capital, and that would be a wonderful gesture of reconciliation. And you're saying that because you're not saying, you're not calling for compensation yourself? Well, I think there should be compensation for those who can trace their uh -huh property uh, which was expropriated. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you can trace it, and some can, uh, there's already been some uh, actions over insurance policies, and this would and tell be Tell me, how active have the Turks been in trying to deny this? Has there been an actual Oh, I campaign? think they've spent billions on it. Uh, I think they've hired Dick Gephardt, who, was, uh, before he was a lobbyist, was uh, a congressman who was actually quite vocal in uh, saying it was an Armenian genocide. Now he's been paid to uh, uh, set up a propaganda exercise to say that it wasn't. So... Um, as the centenary approaches in a, you know, on April the 24th, uh, there has been, there's actually, uh, the government is holding a diver diversification event. They're trying to distract attention by the having a, the Turkish government, by having an international uh, celebration or commemoration of Gallipoli. I see. And they're getting the British Prime, the Australian Prime Minister, the New Zealand Prime Minister, where Gallipoli is sort of sacred. Yeah. Even the young Prince Charles, I think, is going. And the, uh, young but there are princes. human rights groups that are setting up some commemoration, Oh, well, not I, just in Yerevan, but also in Istanbul, as yes, I understand I think And they're they, not getting in the way, are they? No. I think there are human rights groups that are very much focusing on the uh, death of Haran Dink and of course, there are a lot of liberal Turks, and they're getting more courageous mm -hmm. at Haran Dink's funeral. Uh, a lot of young Turkish yes. people held up banners saying, we are all Armenians. And are there things that you'd recommend for people to do to affect attitudes inside Turkey? Well, I think that it is uh, a matter for the Turkish leadership to start explaining uh, of course, you go back to the school textbooks and to what kids are taught. At the moment, they're taught all the arguments for refuting the genocide. They're given prizes for <laughs> writing uh, essays that uh, explain that it wasn't genocide. I think that's got to stop, and there has to be an element of truth-telling, because even Ataturk apologized and, and described it as a shameful act. And I think that kind of information has to be allowed into Turkish textbooks.
Jeffrey Robertson, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.